Well, hey everyone, welcome to episode 309 of F Stop Collaborate and Listen with your host, Matt Payne. This week, I had a wonderful time getting to know Victoria Hawk on the podcast. Victoria's work has always captivated me for its surreal and authentic qualities that evoke emotion and grace. If you're not familiar with her work, I highly recommend perusing it while we talk. We cover a large number of subjects this week, including her story of how she lived on a small island for 10 years, how social media helped her gain clout in the photography community, and how she has chosen not to specialize in any one kind of photography, bucking the advice that most photographers give new photographers, and a lot more. This week, I'm going to forego any formal announcements and just dive right into the show, but please know that your support on Patreon is greatly appreciated and provides me with the resources that I need to continue to produce this show. Thank you. Okay, let's get to this week's show with Victoria Hawk. Victoria Hawk, it is great to have you on the podcast. Thank you, Matt. It's great to be here. And I know I totally didn't do your name correctly because apparently, unless you're not from North America, it's not, it's literally impossible to say your last name correctly. You actually did that really well. Yeah, Victoria Hawk, Hawk the Herald Angels Sing. But yeah, even in the UK, well, it's a German name, but uh, it's a difficult one. Gotcha. Okay. Well, I am very excited for this. I have had you on my list to do a one-on-one podcast for years. And so I'm just elated that we could do it. Thank you, Matt. That's really nice. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Also, I'm a huge fan of your photography and yeah, just keep that up. It's amazing. Oh, that's really nice. Thank you. (laughs) Yeah, of course. Well, for, for the poor seven people that haven't heard of you or seen your work, Why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Okay, um, so it's hard to know how to describe myself, but um, I'm probably best called a multi-genre photographer or a a generalist photographer because I photograph everything from landscapes and nature to, you know, people, stuff, weddings, elopements. I shoot uh, events. I do landscape photography workshops and, and all sorts of different types of workshops. And I've been shooting professionally now for probably just over 15 years, I think. And I would say, I can't remember the exact time, but I think I've been a full-time professional for about five years, I think now. Okay. Um, So I live in Salmon Arm in British Columbia in Canada, but as you can tell from the accent, I'm not actually, or you might not be able to tell, but I'm not from Canada, I'm from the UK. Um, And I moved here in 2007. So yeah, and I, I've got, uh, I'm married, I have one child who has recently left home, so I have wow. probably more freedom than I've had for the last 19 years, which is <laughs> really <laughs> quite different, and yeah, it makes a difference to what you can do with your photography as well, having a bit more uh, space and time. But yeah, that's that's kind of me, I think. I'm looking forward to that. My My son is 15. Right. So... Yeah, you yeah you're kind of in the thick of it at fifteen too. Oh yeah, yeah. Like tonight at dinner, uh, can you take me here on this day? It's like okay, I guess. Yeah, yeah. It's the whole taxi and yeah. We we had a, a fairly it was a fairly interesting ride that we've had, um, and it's it's meant that we haven't I I haven't been able to to travel very much or be away too much. We've had to kind of be around there for our daughter quite a bit. But yeah, for the first time in a long time, it's it, I've got a little bit more freedom, which is nice. Yeah, awesome, awesome. Well, I look forward to hearing how that goes for you, so that I can look forward to that myself. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so you know, I've heard your backstory before, and I it's one of my favorite stories, just in terms of how you got into photography. Um, including your time living on Brown Sea Island. And I would love for you to, to tell the story to us. Okay. Um, so, I mean, I've, I've always been interested in the arts. I've, you know, all through school, I was really interested in the arts. And, um, you know, in the UK, you, you start out studying lots of different subjects and then you gradually kind of narrow down as you go through the school system. 
and I couldn't wait to specialise, I couldn't wait to just do art, that's what I wanted to do and um, by my sort of final two years I was studying art, ceramics, history and classics and I'd got down to the four, couldn't wait to get to the next step of just like just doing the art. Um, and I went to art college and did a foundation course and um, my goal was to be a fine art ceramicist. I wanted to build enormous sculptures, like mm. bigger than a person kind of thing. So then I headed off to art college and I lasted for three months at the, when I went to do the fine art sculpture. So I, I lasted for three months and really my whole world kind of fell apart because I'd been so channeled on what I wanted to do for so long. And then finding that it wasn't sort of working out the way I wanted. Um, I then just kind of worked for a couple of years, just doing, you know, kind of whatever jobs I could get. And then thought, well, I should probably study something, but I didn't know what to study. Cause like, I got to get out of this, doing these kind of really low paid jobs and not knowing what I want to do. So then I thought about it and thought, well, what shall I study? And because I loved art, but that hadn't kind of worked out, I thought, well, maybe I'll do art history. So I went to university and I studied art history and my art history degree um, kind of turned into an anthropology degree because I studied non-Western art. I found I was really drawn to non-Western stuff. Um, when you say non-Western, you mean like in Asia or? Yeah, so I was mainly like my area of kind of specialty was the Inca Empire. In oh, Peru. okay. And I did some stuff on Amazonia and the use of hallucinogenic drugs in Amazonia oh. to create, yeah, it was really interesting. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it kind of went in all sorts of different directions. And um, I found my degree really, really interesting. But by the end of it, you know, I, I kind of looked at my options. And I thought, well, do I go and live with an Amazonian tribe? Like, what is the next step here? And I, I didn't really know. And so I went to the local volunteer bureau and said, you know, I want to do something. Um, is there any anybody looking for a volunteer? And so the National Trust, who are the largest conservation charity in the UK, were looking for a peer warden on Brownsea Island. So this is a small island in the harbour uh, in Poole in Dorset, so on the south coast. Um, it's 500 acres, so it's tiny. Um, and they wanted somebody to stand on the pier and when people were trying to get on boats, tell them which boat, maybe catch a few ropes, that kind of stuff. <laughs> um, so anyway, I went over, I had an interview, they, they let me be a peer warden. Um, and uh, I actually met my husband doing that job. He was one of the boat drivers, <laughs> so I was catching the ropes. <laughs> um, but anyway, so I met him while I was doing that. I ended up working for the National Trust. They offered me some paid work. Um, so then I was working for, you know, Europe's largest conservation charity. And, you know, just to cut a long story short, um, we ended up living on Brownsea Island. My husband was also offered a job by the National Trust and he ended up being the head warden on that island. Um, so that meant that we had a cottage that we could live in there. Um, and you can only live on the island if you work on the island. And so we lived there and we lived there for 10 years. And whilst I was there, you know, 500 acres is not a huge amount of space to walk no. around, <laughs> um, but I would, you know, walk the island pathways every day. We had a dog. I'd take the dog and, and walk around the island. And um, we, we were limited in that there were only boats at like 8.15 in the morning and 4.30 in, in the afternoon. And other than that, you were pretty much stuck. Um, but yeah, walking those island pathways and seeing the same thing, but seeing it change. Mm -hmm. So seeing, you know, when the weather systems changed or... Um, the seasons change, you know, those same pathways that I trod every day look different. Um, and then I would recognize kind of the beauty in this small place and how it changed. And that's when I, um, I pulled my camera out of storage. I was given a camera for my 18th birthday and I pulled that out and started taking photos of what I was seeing as I was walking around. And that's really kind of where my photography journey started. Um, and then because I couldn't, you know, join a photo club or have, you know, really easy access to the library and things like right. that, um, I ended up using the internet to try and kind of learn more about photography. And my nephew, who was living in Canada at the time, said, oh, there's this site called DeviantArt. I don't know. What, do you remember DeviantArt? Um, so I got into DeviantArt when I first got a camera, too. But I don't know. For some reason, I just didn't, I didn't stick around. But I know... I know a lot of people kind of came up through DVR. Like I know 
Alex Nail was really yeah I remember him. Alex from that I remember yeah. Alex from Deviant Art yeah 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 so that's kind of where I started um, just kind of interacting with the photography community and sharing my work getting some feedback um, and where I, I you know I learned lots of stuff about you know how to shoot things and looked at what other people were doing and yeah, so that's kind of that's kind of where it all started. I don't know how much more you want me to <laughs> keep going. Yeah, I mean, so that, you ever look back on on some of those images and and get re-inspired by kind of what captivated you about the island? Yeah, but then I think what happened was I looked at social media, and as you do, I saw that that's not what photography looked like. You know, at the time, the likes of I think it, you know, like Ryan Dyer and people like that were creating imagery and so seeing you know these fantastic landscapes and that kind of stuff and that's not what I was really experiencing um, so yeah it was it was interesting and when I moved to Canada I, I did have access to those kind of landscapes you know I could go into the Rockies there were big mountains and um, yeah so yeah sorry I lost the thread of what you were asking me there. no you're good I, I'm just curious because when I think back to when I very, very first picked up a camera, you know, you, for, for starters, like you really don't know anything about what you're doing, but you also are like, everything looks cool. You know what I mean? Yes. Like, yeah, absolutely. and so like you take pictures of all kinds of stuff, hoping you get something interesting. And I don't know, I, I look back in some of those images that I took way back in like, you know, 2009, 2008. And there's not very many good ones, but they're all very unique. Yeah, yeah. And, and I mean, I was photographing not just the landscape, but I was also photographing my daughter, the dog, you know, the wildlife on the island. So right. I was photographing, you know, everything around me. And I think photographing my daughter and that kind of stuff, too, was probably one of the things that got me into people photography as well. So, right. yeah, it was, uh, I think... Yeah, it was an interesting start, but I think that isolation and, um, you know, being stuck on in this small space, when I look back at it, probably influenced quite a lot of my photography journey, really. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious, uh, what were some of the factors about living on an island that helped you gain a curiosity for nature, specifically through photography? I think one of the things that was really um, probably just living on a nature reserve, like this whole island was a nature reserve. It was beautiful. We had a population of red squirrels that are um, endangered throughout the UK. There's only a couple of places that you can see them. Um, there were no roads, really. You know, there's a few dirt tracks and a couple of National Trust Land Rovers, but we walked everywhere on the island. Um, having to cross the ocean, even though it was only a seven minute crossing, you know, you were battered by the waves and by, you know, like storms and like nature was right there. Like the dirt came in the door, like there wasn't a paved, you know, no paved. We had, you, you, if we left the door of the cottage open, that we, I'd come in and find chickens in the kitchen. Like there was just <laughs> the wildlife and the, um, yeah, it was just it was just not like living in a city. And I think just really, I just really connected with nature. And I've always, I've never wanted to lose that. I've never wanted to be back in a city. I've, I love the fact that I, you know, I, I, I kind of feel the change of the seasons. I, I don't want to go back to being in a city and only noticing that because the trees are a different color. You know, I can actually feel. I sometimes I say to my friends, you know, I can feel the spring is coming and she'll say, it's not due to be, it's not here for another few, you know, and I'm like, no, I can feel the spring coming. <laughs> like, <laughs> you just, if you're out in it enough, you feel, you feel it. No, that's true. Yeah. Cause yeah. you're, you're, you're so much more connected to it. Yeah, totally. And, and I think it's, I mean, now we're going off on a tangent about nature, but I feel like when you spend a lot of time in nature, you, you kind of, realize that there's you know there's nothing wrong in certain things when they seem to go wrong like nature goes wrong things are imperfect um it kind of levels everything out and um it if i'm struggling with stuff i go out with the dog and i just walk in the forest and it just helps to kind of right we kind of recalibrate everything yeah. and my watch says so too because my my heart rate just goes goes down yeah yeah 
So, uh, so what brought you to Canada? Um, so we, we'd lived on the island for 10 years. Um, we wanted to be able to maybe go out for dinner occasionally and not come back like a drowned rat. Like the number of times that I'd like try and dress up a bit, get on this small, we just have like a little outboard thing and we cross over to go and have dinner. And I'd just come back with just like, just my, my husband throwing me off the boat saying, go around the get off and catch the rope. And like, just being soaked and we just thought well it'd be nice to be able to go out for dinner sometimes and maybe go to the movies and um, our daughter was getting to school age and so we were looking at schools and it was quite difficult to get her into the local schools so um, we wanted to go somewhere that had you know lots of natural beauty um, my brother lived in Canada my mum had recently moved there and then my dad and his partner moved there so it was kind of a natural thing it was either New Zealand or Canada for us and so yeah we came to, to Canada and we moved to Salmon Arm which is a very small town in Canada and again yeah, where, that probably, yeah where is it exactly it's, it's in BC but it's it's kind of midway between Calgary and Vancouver if you take the main highway um, okay and it's it's not that far from the border uh, with the US um, gotcha. but it, it's, it's pretty small and and I think probably living in Salmon Arm also affected some of my journey as a photographer as well, I think. How, how many people live there? Oh, I, I'm terrible with numbers. I don't know. Okay. It's, it's called a city, but it by English terms, it's not a city. It's pretty small. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I live in a, my the town I live in is 20,000. Right. So pretty small. Yeah, I honestly, numbers mean absolutely nothing to me, Matt. Like, <laughs> I can't even say them. doesn't mean a thing. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. Well, um, so you talked about deviant art. Yeah. Um, and I'm still trying to piece together kind of like you're on this island for 10 years. You moved to Canada. Um, at what point did you decide uh, that photography was something you wanted to do seriously? Was it before you left the island or was it after you left the island? So when I lived on the island, <clears throat> I was taking lots of photos and uh, the National Trust actually, um, I, I made some cards and some little cards and put them in the shop on the island and people would buy them pictures of red squirrels and things like that and you know sunsets and that kind of stuff. And then the Nat National Trust commissioned me to do a few things. I had some big images in the cafe there and then um, when you landed on the boat and there was kind of an entrance area, there were big pictures that I'd, I'd taken um, in there. And yeah, so basically my first client was the National Trust, which is pretty epic because yeah. they are like the largest conservation charity in Europe. Um, but that's kind of where I started out with, with actually it becoming a career. Um, and then when I moved to Canada, I was using social media a lot because I always had, because that's just how I, because I lived on an island. So I continued right. to, to use social media. So I use like Facebook and things and I would post, you know, I was so excited to get to Canada to suddenly have all of this space and not have 500 acres and be able to, you know, travel a bit further. And so then I continued to post my images online and, you know, sometimes a picture of my daughter or the dog or whatever, but quite a lot of landscapes and things. And then people would ask me if I could take pictures of their family and, you know, like the usual thing that happens as a photographer. Right. And people just assumed, you know, they'd ask me to do, I don't know, food shoots and things like that. Just all sorts of random stuff. I lived in a small town. She's a photographer. She must be able to do this. And so I'd just be like, well, I'll give it a go. Like, I, I don't know. <laughs> so I ended up doing lots of different types of photography, I think partly because I lived in a small town. Um, and I did a lot of uh, kind of uh, non-paid stuff as well to get my name out. So I would do, if there was an event happening, a charitable event or something, I would go and shoot for them and do it for free. And then they would share some of my stuff on their social media and then that would get my name out a bit more. And, um, and then I branched into the kind of scary world of shooting weddings and elopements and stuff as well which I figured I wouldn't, you know, like I was like, I'm never going to do that again. I did the first one. I was like, never again. But then I gradually, you know, got more confident with it and um, continued to do it. And that's kind of where it, it you know, the, the people photography was where the money kind of came in. And, um, 
you know, I was I'd sell the occasional print or something like that of a landscape, but um, it was a people photography that was making me the money and the and the nature photography was where I went to kind of get away from the people and just, yeah, recharge really. Right. So I'm curious, um, how has social media and your involvement in it played a role in your development as a photographer? I mean, you talked a little bit about DeviantArt, but it sounds like that was just the beginning. Yeah, I mean, I think um, just, I think because it's always been part of my journey, it's continued to be part of my journey. And then when I, um, when I was thinking that I might want to start this off as a business, I went to, um, I went to a course that was put on by a, um, a local small business development, um, uh, what it's something or other like a uh, yeah. you know like a business development thing and it was on social media and so i went to that and i listened to what they had to say and they said you know think about who buys things like who you know why do you buy things you usually buy things because your friend says hey this is this is a great product or this is you know something to buy and they said you need to think of social media as word of mouth but on a global scale and so like i just took that one idea was like okay <laughs> okay so i'm talking to all these people like i'm you know this is this is this is how i can create my business as well um, and i've never used social media to tell people about my personal life really you know like i choose to keep that uh off of there i choose to i don't like being in front of the camera i don't want to have it about me um I don't want to talk about my family. You'll never know if I'm having a disaster happening in my life. Um, but it, so I, I use it as a business tool. And don't get me wrong, I'm there because I also like a lot of the people that I've met and what have you. So I, I have really genuine connections with people on there. But um, yeah, it's it's kind of a business tool for me. And I've kind of lost the thread of the question again. <laughs> no, you're good. I'll, I'll, keep, I'll keep it going. Um, no, it's interesting because I... You know, I was actually, uh, I think I was on Instagram yesterday right? and I, and I, something of yours popped up and it was, I feel like you do a really good job of, um, being genuine without it being super, I don't know, ga gamified, if that's a word I want to use. Like you're not, it's not obvious to me that you're just trying to like please the algorithms. You're just like, Oh, this is something cool I did today. And check it out but you did you did this video of um like this portrait shoot of a woman oh, in yeah. a dress on the beach and the gray skies and mm -hmm. then you just did like a really quick like like video you know like time lapse video of you editing the photo yeah. and here's the before and after and i was like oh that was really that was cool but um i feel like you use social media in the right way well, I'm kind of like, I know, I know how you, I know what they want you to do. I know that they want you to post regularly, that they want you to do reels, that they want you to do all the things. And because it's a business, I, I, I have to play into that to some extent, but I also choose to, um, separate from that in my mind <laughs> so that I don't feel, uh, kind of. I don't know, like I don't have my notifications on. I choose the time that I want to interact on social media. Um, I understand the game, I'm playing the game, but I'm also, I want to be genuine in that too. And I feel like if people take the time to interact with me on social media, how does it feel when people don't bother to respond to you? How does it feel if you have a conversation with someone and they never say anything? So that's to me, like, if somebody says something, then, you know, obviously I don't always have time, but like they've taken the time, so right. I'm going to take the time. And I think that says things about who you are as a person and who you are as a business as well. So I don't want people to think that if they book me for their elopement, I'm not going to be available to, you know, like interact with them and what have you. So, yeah. And I'm curious because you, it sounds like you got started pretty heavily in social media about the same time I did. And my success on social media is not very good <laughs> because, <laughs> <don't do> <laughs> no, because, well, I mean, I just, comp you know, you shouldn't do this, but I do it anyway, but I compare myself to a few people that I 
that I started photography at the same time as they did. And I look at their social media following and they have like 400,000 Facebook fans or whatever. And I have like 8,000. And the difference is they, well, I guess a couple of things. They stayed very, very active constantly. Like every day I have to post, 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 you know, there was years where I was like, yeah, I'll post maybe once a week or something. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing is I saw, like, I found that for a lot of people that are, have a huge following on social media, they've kind of figured out the formula. Like, um, like this one guy, he would like post a picture on his Facebook page and then he would reshare that picture on every single like group and um, every other even somewhat relevant page of Facebook that's in the local area right. in the hopes that they would then share it and then he would yeah. gain all these followers. Yeah. And I know that's not as effective today, but back then that was a pretty good strategy, yeah. but I always felt like it was, it just felt dirty to me, so I didn't do it. Um, yeah. So I'm curious, like, how do you, how do you walk that line? I, I've walked many lines on social media and they haven't always been the best ones. <laughs> and I've played the game and it hasn't, you know, like I've, I've done the things. Um, but, and I think, you know, the thing with social media is it, it's about connectivity. So it's about, you know, that person kind of had it right in that the more people you connect with, the more people that share it, the more that it, you know, that that's kind of what it's all about. But I think, you know, there are ways of doing it where you are more genuine you, you can understand it you you know what you're doing um but you don't have to i don't know like there's just ways of of being more genuine and i think for me like i've always i've you know it's really great when you get a bunch of likes on something but at the end of the day you know you you feel kind of hollow if that's all you're if that's all you're sharing if you're only and i've been there i've done that you know I've, i know what will get likes and i've posted it and it's great and then it's like but then I'm stuck in this place where, you know, I have to post that same stuff if I want to get those likes. Mm -hmm. But my philosophy has always been to keep the box wide open. I don't want to be in a small box. I don't want to have people know exactly what I'm going to post. And I don't want to feel like, you know, like if I know if I post this amazing sunset, these, this, you know, wild mountain scene with great sunsets, they're going to get loads of likes and then I'm going to post you know, a picture of a leaf or something and people are just going to be like, oh, <laughs> but at the same time, like I want to post that leaf because I want to be able to post it for myself. And I hope to kind of bring people with me on that journey. And so my kind of way of doing it is rather than because I, you know, particularly over COVID, I really got interested in shooting smaller scenes again and really remembering why I picked up my camera and, you know, what I tried to do was to keep, you know, keep posting some stuff that I know that people really like, but then I'm going to interject some stuff that they maybe won't like, or they haven't seen before, or they don't expect. So then, you know, I'll have one image that will kind of tank and I don't care because I'm like, the next one I post is going to do okay. <laughs> so I kind of know, you know, that I can post something small and something quiet or something different and then post something. So what I'm hoping to do is to bring my following with me to try to uh, kind of not educate them in what I like, but to, you know, show them things that I like and see if I can bring them rather than be just like, I'm going to post all of these big landscapes. And now I'm just going to post pictures of kids <laughs> and right. hope that they stay with me. I know they're not going to, but if I just put, you know, a picture of a kid in there occasionally or whatever it is, or a dog or whatever I want to shoot, it's not so bad for them. They haven't lost all of that other stuff. They'll still get some, but they'll get something else as well. So I'm trying to introduce, uh, you know, the things that I'm interested in. I I feel like that's kind of a perfect segue to my next question because it kind of foreshadows some of your strategy and I'm not, I'm not even sure it's intentional, but I think it's brilliant. So I know you've described yourself as a generalist and I even wrote about that extensively in my article about you for on landscape. But I'm curious if you can tell us how that's actually worked out for you. I, I feel like most people advise photographers to deeply specialize, right? Like become 
the thing, the one thing that people know you for, mm -hmm. but you've done the opposite. And so I want to hear like how that's worked for you. Yeah, I mean, I heard the same thing, you know, the same thing of like, you should decide what you want to be as a photographer and you need to niche down and you need to. <clears throat> and so for all of my youth where I wanted to niche down and be a specific kind of an artist, once I got into photography, kind of the opposite happened. And I just couldn't let go of anything because I was like, I, but I want to shoot that coffee cup with the backlit steam and I want to shoot you know that dog or I want to shoot that thing and so I just thought well I'm just gonna shoot it and then some people shoot it but they don't share it right so they might be you know shooting landscapes and or shooting weddings and not sharing their landscapes or whatever but I just felt like you know I'm just gonna I'm just gonna share it too and I don't care if people don't like it um so sorry going back to the question again um sorry what was the question again Matt <laughs> Well, no, I'm just like, how has it worked? Um, oh, okay. So, yeah. So, it, like, I feel like um, I would use things like, you know, if I post a nice landscape, for example, on my social media, I think about who sees that, who's not in the market necessarily for, you know, like a landscape or something that people like. They see it, they like it, they're like, oh, that's that photographer. And then, they get married or they're going to get married and they're like, oh, we need a photographer. And then they think, oh, I've seen, you know, and so some, sometimes all of those different things connect. So, you know, I, I do quite a bit of tourism work because I can shoot a landscape and I can shoot people and I can right. put them together um, and events and different things. You know, an event is very much like a wedding. You don't know what's going to happen. All of these different things overlap. Um, and so I found that, um, the diversity of what I shoot, which is probably partly to do with being in a very small town. So I think if I lived in a city, I'd probably have to be an, you know, maybe a food photographer or, you know, a wedding photographer. But because of where I live and because people ask me to do all these different things, I, you know, I, I've got this much more kind of uh, general approach. And I think the first time that I even realized that it was a thing that was different was 500 px reached out to me and said would i write a, an article about being a generalist and i was like oh what's a generalist <laughs> <I'm> like what's <laughs> that <laughs> oh, oh i think oh, i'm one of those <laughs> so um so then i had to think about it you know and like what is it to be you know because everybody tells you not to do this and so strangely enough after that i got more and more kind of writing gigs and things and you know magazines would take me on as a writer not and because they knew that I could cover a whole bunch of different genres and not just the one thing but I could write about weddings or something and then I could write about because I was shooting all these different things and then recently I don't know whether you've ever come across um I've got it I made a note of it um there's a book by David Epstein called Range Why mm. Generalists Triumph in a Specialized World have you heard of that one I have not Oh, well, I, I, I came across that and I was like, whoa, like, I need to read this. <laughs> so I, I actually haven't read the whole book, but I read part of it. And um, it was just really interesting because he made the case for the longevity of generalists, how they can go a longer distance often, how specialists will peak early. Hmm. But generalists are kind of, it's a longer haul for them. Um, and there was one quote, because I love to read things and then kind of keep little things that are interesting. Um, there was one quote by that was in the book by Reshma Sajani. And it says, being a generalist allows you to raise your hand when you don't know exactly what you're doing because you have built this base of skill set that gives you the confidence to know that you can get in and try it and figure it out. I love and it. That, that's kind of that's kind of me. Like I'll. I don't really know what I'm doing, but I'll give it a go. And because of the different things that I know about the different genres, they cross pollinate. And so it allows me to cross boundaries. So yeah. For example, if, you know, if I know how to shoot a landscape and then a couple come to me who want me to cover their wedding and they're like, but we really want this epic landscape and, you know, us to be in it. I'm like, okay, I, I know how like, to shoot a landscape. No problem. <laughs> yeah, I can do that. And then, so they, they really cross pollinate, you know, I'll use like, long exposure photography in some of my portrait work, environmental portrait kind of stuff. And um, just so many different ways, even, you know, photographing small scenes in nature can be similar to shooting a portrait. So shooting through things 
to kind of soften parts of the frame and you know that's kind of how I would shoot a person but then with, when I come to shoot a leaf sometimes it's the same so all of those things are skills that you can bring together and yeah um, I'm super curious though so is there one type within that generalist umbrella that if you had to pick to just do that one would do you have a favorite I I really like doing all of them honestly but right. uh, I, I at one point I was shooting lots and lots of weddings and people stuff all through the summer and I just wanted to run to the mountains <laughs> just get me out of here because you know I, I'm an introvert too so I find it quite difficult to just keep that energy up and like I just wanted to get away and I think if I had to just shoot one thing it would be nature like no doubt it would be nature if I could get a dog in there sometimes that'd be good or <laughs> you know I want to try and I want, I'd like to shoot some more wildlife I've got some longer lenses now from Nikon and I want to extend that and maybe get into a bit of wildlife photography and stuff but definitely nature because it, it means so much you know like nature means so much to me it's the one thing that I just right. could not like give up so for for you I'm curious like is the generalist approach is it more of a means to an end in terms of like you you, you know you can get you can do it uh, um but it's a lot easier to have a much more rounded income stream like multiple income streams if you can do the occasional event shoot and you can do the occasional portrait shoot and you can do the occasional wedding and you can do a a tourism gig and oh and by the way i can also make some prints or like i feel like is it is it like i'm i'm, I'm not hearing you say you love doing all those other things but you're clearly very good at all of those things. So. I, I, I do really, I really like, I really like doing all those other things. And I think that those other things take the pressure off of my nature photography. So oh, yeah, okay. to be able to not have to monetize that, you know, like I do in, you know, and, and it's happening more and more. It seems to be organically kind of happening, right. but um, it, it takes the pressure off of that. I don't have to, you know, create an ebook or, you know, really sell, I don't know it, and it means that I, I feel like I'm more honest with my nature photography because I don't really care if you like right. it or not like I'm just yeah. gonna shoot it and I don't have to make money out of it because I know I can drive for 10 minutes up the road and shoot a wedding and make a lot more money than I would make slogging my guts over that thing <laughs> but nature photography so it just gives me more options and yeah I I, I really like the fact that I can do that but I also find that you know sometimes you know when you you don't know what to shoot as a nature photographer or you go out and like nothing's inspiring and you can't think of what to photograph if i know that i have to go shoot someone's elopement i have to pick the camera up and I, then i have to find the inspiration and i have to shoot and so i do and it reignites it and i see something different and i can turn my head in a different direction and find inspiration that may be unlacking in that one area that makes sense so, yeah, it, it does. I find that it helps me, you know, and just, you know, doing, I, I, I can, I can feel really creative doing a tourism shoot or, you know, there's, there's so many ways to be creative and, they, and it's just, yeah. Yeah. I just did a, um, I just did a big project for Atlas Obscura. They wanted me to photograph eight locations in winter in Colorado. And I think they picked me because all the locations were sort of close to me, which I live in the middle of nowhere. So, um, but it was, it was super fun. Like, yeah. you know, I, I've, I've been to like some of them, but not all of them. And yeah, I really had to put my, you know, take the creativity up a notch. <laughs> yeah. I, mean, I think, um, sometimes it's harder when you're shooting a kind of a natural, like a landscape thing that you have to shoot for a project, you know, for a paid project. Cause it's like, well, yeah. what if weather's terrible? What if, you know, like what if the conditions are, so that puts added pressure on. But when you shoot something like a wedding, there's nothing you can do. Like you don't control anything. It's just on that day, right. nobody can, you know, you can't, you don't have to go back several times to get the right light. It's just that day. And so you just shoot it. So even though some, I used to find that quite a lot of pressure. Now I'm just like, it's, it's easy. I just go and I shoot with whatever 
happens you know like it's not my fault if the sun doesn't shine or if it rains or if the bride's not happy that's not my fault i just shoot it you know like yeah it's, it's it's great it takes all the pressure off i don't have to deliver something that's difficult i just have to you know capture the emotions and you know be creative but i i don't have to keep going back and back which adds pressure i think sometimes to those kind of jobs where you know that you've just described sometimes yeah i i was talking about this project with a friend of mine who is the his name's mason cummings and actually he was on the podcast but he's he was used to be the staff photographer for the wilderness society so he, they would send him out on he would send himself out on assignments all the time but now he has to hire people but anyway he said something that really stuck with me and that's like they don't know about the photos you didn't take right yeah so it's like they only see what you give them and and if you're fine with them then they're they're probably going to be happy too so yeah you yeah know? yeah it's true yeah well we sort of already touched on this a little bit but i would love for you to maybe go into a little bit more detail um you know obviously making it as a full-time photographer is a massive commitment with a ton of risk mm -hmm. and i'm curious how you've been able to stay afloat in such a competitive space well my husband working is really <laughs> handy <laughs> um so yeah obviously if you if you share a household with someone and they're helping to pay the bills that's great <laughs> so it really helps um and um yeah, I mean, it's taken a long time for me to go full time as a professional photographer. So it was kind of a side gig. And then I was working a couple of mornings a week at the local shelter, animal shelter. And that was just my guaranteed income. But then I realized that those two mornings actually became like two days that I couldn't be doing photography. And eventually I was like, I can make more money, you know, just, you know, like I, I need to, to move out of that. And so, um, yeah, I think um things like shooting the uh as the, the the general stuff that i shoot shooting the people stuff uh for example when covid hit and lots of photographers their workshops tanked and they couldn't you know they couldn't do things like that people were still having small elopements and you know i, I photograph outdoors a lot i could still shoot people with long lenses and you know so my income wasn't impacted in the same way so um i just i feel like the diversity of my of what I do helps to keep me afloat, helps to keep the various income streams coming in. And they do seem to knock on to each other. They do seem to, you know, like I said, you know, tourism and tourism shoots because they know I can shoot landscapes and people and, you know, like. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. <clears throat> okay. Well, when we first corresponded about this episode, you told me about this concept and I still have no idea what it means. So you, I'm going to have to rely oh, on it. I was going to ask you. <laughs> <laughs> but um, can you tell us about this idea of gardening, not architecture, and how that's factored into your photography career? Okay, well, I don't fully understand it. <laughs> that's the thing. But I came across, I came across a quote. And it was by, I think I've made a note of it. Let me just see. <coughs> so it was by the, the guy who wrote the books that inspired Game of Thrones. And so um, it was a quote based off of Brian Eno's quote of gardening, not architecture. So Brian Eno is a producer, a music producer who's produced stuff for U2 and people like that. So the quote was, I've always said that there, that there are, to oversimplify it, two kinds of writers. There are architects and gardeners. The architects do blueprints before they die, drive, the first, drive the first nail. They design the entire house, where the pipes are running and how many rooms there are going to be, how high the roof will be. But the gardeners just dig a hole and plant the seed and see what comes up. And so then I kind of looked, I was like, oh, that's really interesting. Um, and then I looked up Brian Eno and his quote, and he said, since I've always preferred making plans to executing them, I've gravitated towards situations and systems that once set into operation could create music with little or no intervention on my part. That is to say, I tend towards the roles of planner and programmer and then become an audience to the results. And I found myself, uh, when I talk to other photographers who talk about their goals for the year and their plans for this and that. And I, I, I find myself sitting there thinking, 
I don't, I don't have those. <laughs> and you're like, what, am wrong? I doing this wrong? Or? I, yeah, what's my business plan? Like, what is that? Like, I don't, I don't have that. <laughs> I, 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 and I've never had that. And I've always felt like I've, I'm really bad at business, but I'm managing somehow. Yeah, so yeah. then when I heard that quote, I was like, wow, like, I feel like I kind of do do this kind of seed planting and just let it and see what happens rather than designing where I'm going to be. Um, and so because I don't really understand it, that quote either, I just know that it, it, it's something that I kind of do. Um, and I think it's about um, it, another quote I, I read in relation to it was design beginnings, not endings. So you kind of start it off and then you see what happens. And I was trying to think of examples of where I do that. <laughs> and then I was thinking about things like my social media and stuff. And I was thinking about some of the ways that I work on there and some of the seeds that I plant, which I don't know whether they're going to do anything. And I'm not really conscious of even planting them, but sometimes they seem to produce results. Um, like for example, if you posted a really cool video of a photo shoot, oh, lo and behold, someone reaches out and they want to book a time for you to do their photo shoot too. That kind yeah, of thing? I mean, there's, the, yeah, like there's so many different things, like even choosing to, you know, like at, when my social media was growing, I would get approached by different companies to, you know, work with them, collaborate with them. And then I would look at the company and think, oh, I do, you know, like, they're going to pay me some money. Like, shall I do this? It would be great to have this money. But then I think, but if I do this, I don't want to go down that road. I don't want to be associated with that kind of thing. And so I thought, okay, I'm not going to do that. So I held out for different things. And then I've been lucky enough to be an ambassador for Nikon and different people. So I've kind of held out for the things that, you know, I've really wanted. Um, I'm trying to think of other examples of, um, of that kind of thing. Um, I think even, you know, even things like, I, I don't know, even things like, oh, I've, I've now I've lost the thread of it. Sorry, Matt. That's okay. <laughs> Uh, other examples? Yeah, I'm just trying to think of other examples. Uh, I, I don't know. I think like uh, when COVID happened, I I thought it would be interesting to share other photographers' work that I really liked in my stories and do like a Friday feature kind of thing. And mm -hmm. so I started doing that and I was like, this is great. You know, I'm connecting with these other photographers that I really like. Also, this is not the kind of work that I'm producing, but I really like it and I want to do some more stuff like this. So then I'm thinking, well, you know, my followers are going to see this work. I'm kind of laying a foundation for what I would like to do. I'd like to do something that's more along these lines. So they're seeing it. So I'm kind of like laying, the, throwing the seeds out there. of <laughs> Like I'm going to do this kind of thing, maybe right. so I think that kind of thing. And then I also found that I on the and I think off the back of some of that, I was asked to then start judging competitions. So that was interesting too, because it's like I was showing the work of artists that I really liked and things I genuinely liked. I was connecting with those artists, you know, in direct messages and they were really, you know, really great connections. It doesn't hurt to, you know, I wasn't doing the whole GM friends thing. Like it was genuine. <laughs> I really like, you know, I really liked the art that I was seeing and I, I wanted to share it. But, you know, I was also maybe not even consciously laying the seeds for like, I really like this stuff and maybe producing some of that work and then perhaps getting a few judging gigs as well. Out, Which out wasn't in your business plan, right? No, no, no. Like it, it, you know, so it's, I think, you know, that kind of thing. And I haven't, I, I kind of regretted putting that in the little form that you got me to fill out because then I was like, I, I don't know how I'm going to explain. <laughs> well, no, maybe this is, um. You know, my, my follow-up question takes a little bit of pressure off, but, uh, <laughs> you know, what kind of seeds would you suggest others plant if they're just getting started in photography? Yeah, I mean, I think that's, it's a really difficult thing because it depends on the photographer. Like, I think everybody's, everybody has to go in the direction that they, that they want to go in. And I think I always rely on my intuition for everything, you know, just everything does it feel right is it you know and if it doesn't feel right probably shouldn't do it um and i think um 
yeah I mean just listen to your intuition shoot what you really like what you love what speaks to you as much as you you know everybody gets dragged along on the things that do well and you know it's just part of the journey I think you 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 kind of do that but I think if you can hold on to what you genuinely really like and I think sometimes um you know, we all feel like we have to go and shoot the, the amazing mountain, but sometimes you'll become a photographer of some interest because maybe you live on a tiny island and you just shoot the tiny island. You know, like if I still lived on that tiny island, maybe, you know, I would be a different photographer, but, you know, maybe I would make a name for myself shooting this tiny island in, in different ways or whatever. I think that's what makes people unique. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I, 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 don't, I don't really... Not sure if I answered that one really, but I'm just thinking back <clears throat> to when I first started, and I and I and <clears throat> every once in a while I come across people who you know maybe they just got started like a month ago or a year ago or whatever, and you know they're already talking about oh I'm gonna approach a gallery to get my work in a gallery and like they have all these ambitions and plans and I always want to tell them like oh man you should just spend some more time focusing on getting to know yourself and getting to know what you love about photography and like organically and slowly build up who you are to the world and don't force it because I feel like a lot of people want to take all these shortcuts to get them get out there like oh I only have 300 Instagram followers and no one's ever going to know who I am it's like well yeah but that I only had 300 Instagram followers at one point too I mean it's yeah, it, it, it takes just, time. Everybody right. wants everything now, don't they? Yeah. Right. And it, it does take time. And I think you, and also you don't want to kind of, I don't know, I'm glad that I, I mean, I find it hard enough to have a, to, to speak or have a voice or have an opinion uh, publicly now. Uh, I'm glad I didn't have to do that back then. Like it would be even worse. Like I, I need <laughs> time. Like I, you know, I'm only now having the time to read things, to formulate ideas, things that I didn't really have time. I was so busy just grafting and trying to run a business and create some income. I didn't really have time to think about many of the things that I now have time to think about. Um, mm -hmm. And so you kind of don't want to peak too early. Like there's, it's a journey. <laughs> you got to let it marinate and you got to bring different things in and you got to realize things about what has effect you know what's affected you in the past why does it make you the person that you are the photographer that you are all those different things come together yeah no that's that's good i mean we've already been talking a little bit about this but i'd be curious if you could tell us kind of what do you think makes the most sense for people to get their work seen like I, especially if you don't necessarily have a following um yeah i mean it's difficult isn't it um I don't know. I think, you know, if you, there's so there are so many different ways of doing it and social media is only one of the ways, um, but it is quite a big way these days. And I mean, obviously, right. you know, there's things like websites and mailing lists and all that kind of stuff um, and blogs and things. But if you are going to use social media, um, then I think, you know, genuine interactions, actual, you know, thinking about the fact that it's a person on the other side of the of what's been written like I try to you know like I try to think about when somebody says something nice about my work I try and think about they took the time to say that right like I really need to take the time to genuinely be appreciative of what they've said um so yeah I mean I think genuine interactions with people like it is about connectivity if you're using social media if you want to get seen and stuff you have to kind of connect but the, the other thing i should mention about social media too because i know you know people complain about how much time it sucks out of their life and all this kind of stuff which it does but if you think about it as a business if you think about it as you know well i i could go and work in an office or i could walk walk in the woods and stop with my dog and sit on a log for 10 minutes and do some social media like I know which I would rather do like so I don't I don't I don't object to it because I think well I can do this in the woods I can you know I can sit down by the lake and I can open my phone and I can 
do my social media, I feel so lucky that I'm not stuck in an office. And so right. I, I, I kind of try, I turn it around and I think of it that way. And I, you know, I think how in the past I might've had to put, you know, an advert in the newspaper or, you know, go down to the local mall and pin up a whole bunch of stuff. And I, and I don't have to do that anymore. I can use social media to do it and I can, you know, I can answer my emails in a beautiful field, <laughs> you know, if I want to. Yeah. Rather than you know going you know going into an office and shutting the door and not having any sunlight and you know whatever so I think you know there's just there's ways of thinking about it. Yeah, as you were talking, I was trying to think how I would answer that question, and it's especially nowadays with how competitive it's become to to make a name for yourself. I think the most logical thing you could do instead of Hey, don't, you know, stop comparing yourself to other people and like, oh, how come they have a hundred thousand Instagram followers and I don't, but I would, I would think about how can you provide value to your audience in a way that isn't about you, right? Like maybe you can write articles or blog posts about other people, or maybe you can do a podcast or maybe you can do YouTube videos that are, you know, authentic and genuine, or maybe, or you can even like just show people images of other people's work that you like. Mm -hmm. um, I think if you have to establish something about you that you are going to be known for somehow, that's not just, oh, he's that guy that makes those really cool photographs of whatever. I think yeah. nowadays there has to be like this other layer on top of that. Yeah, I think so. I think, you know, providing something, some value to people, some, you know, like just small I don't know, even just, you know, using reels, which people hate, but maybe to show something or provide some free information or, um, yeah, I think all of that. I stuff mean, is... you could even do like a reel about a reel. That's like, here's six photos from other people. I saw this week that I liked. I, I and know, then... Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, it's, you can't, yeah. As long as you know that, uh, that you're having to play the game, the social media game, you know, as long as you understand that you're playing the game, as long as you don't get sucked in with that horrible feeling that you, I don't know, right. but as long as you can just get it in the right place in your head, I think it's all, it's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. <clears throat> well, I'm curious. You said you were an introvert. Yes. <laughs> I, that's not uncommon in this space. I'm curious how you've overcome the challenges of being an introvert as it relates to public speaking, teaching and social media. Yeah. I mean, I haven't really overcome it. Like I'm still <laughs> struggling with it. It's a work in progress. Um, certainly when it comes to things like, um, public speaking, that is my nemesis. The thing that I hated in school at university, I was always wanted to ask the question, but would be the one, the kid in the class that was just like, I can't put my hand up. I can't ask the question. I can't. So it was, it's always been a real problem for me. Um, and I, I, I am hoping that I, I've kind of done some reading around it, done some reading about fear and how to, you know, deal with it. Um, and I, from what I can can gather is you have to go through it. Like you have, there isn't a way around it. You have to go through it to yes. kind of conquer it. And so I'm in that process and it's not easy. Um, but uh, I remember when I first started doing photography and, you know, doing like people photography and then somebody would book me for a family shoot or something. And I'd be trying to think of poses and I was really stressed and I couldn't think of them. And so I'd have stuff on my phone right. to try and help me and, you know, get me through that. And then gradually over time it got better and it got easier. And that's just my hope is that if I keep doing it, maybe, you know, as long as I, there's nothing that's too disastrous, I'll keep doing it and hoping that it gets better. And for things like public speaking, I'm doing, you know, with Zoom, it's great now that you don't have to actually stand in front of people. You can do it in your own house with your own glass of whiskey if you want to. <laughs> um, and, you know, that's a, a way for me to kind of practice, but not standing in front of, you know, a load of people, which I'm, 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 and as a, as a, an ambassador for, you know, like Nikon and stuff, I have to do that. Um, and I remember the first time I, I wasn't an ambassador for Nikon. I was just a partner 
with them and they said would i go to toronto and speak at this event and i was just like oh my god this is you're like you want me to do what yeah i was like no <laughs> no I, I just i really don't want to do this and then i thought about you know what what did i really want to work with nikon like ha, ha, what did i feel about this and i was like i really want to work with nikon so i'm just gonna do this thing and so i i did it and so that's kind of that's my motivation and that and also i think that you know, particularly in the landscape and nature photography field, there aren't that many women that we necessarily see. There are lots of us doing it, but we don't necessarily see lots of us kind of speaking or, you right. know, being in front of people. And so I feel like I need to do it for that too, which, which is a motivation for me. Like, I feel like I've, I've got to, I've got to do it for that. So yeah, for the, for the public speaking thing, for, in terms of um, education stuff, like, teaching a workshop and standing in front of a group of workshop participants is no problem at all for me. I don't struggle with that at all. You know, like a one-to-one -one mentoring session, no problem. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it's just that kind of, I think it's the thought that, you know, the things that I say are going to live around, you know, they're going to be there. <laughs> what am I going to say? <laughs> and I have that issue with my brain shuts down because I feel really anxious about it. So I actually cannot think of you know, I can't think of what I should say. I know it's in there, but I just can't access it. So that is right. the struggle. But I think it's just it's just like a muscle thing. I think I just got to keep doing it and um, hope that it that it gets better. Yeah, no, I think that's great advice. Practice, you know, I mean, you think about public speaking, especially, you know, if you start off with an audience of two people and you do a s speech and then you bump it up to four people and then bump it to six. Like it's going to get easier the more you do it. And eventually it's like, okay, it's really not that big of a deal. Right. But you have to start somewhere. Yeah. I'm hoping so. I'm definitely not there yet, Matt. <laughs> I'm a long way from, you know, when people ask me to speak and, and you know, on, on the one hand, I'm like, Oh, that's really nice that they want me to do that. And on the other, I'm like, no, I really don't want to do. That. <laughs> no, I get it. I, um, it's funny. I'm a, I'm the chair of our planning commission here in this town. And, you know, like you have to go to these public hearings once a month and you, you're mm -hmm. like in charge of the whole hearing and there's an audience and it's recorded. So if you say something really yeah. bad, it's like in perpetuity. And I remember a couple months ago, there was a city council referendum and I didn't have to go, but like, I was really afraid that they were going to misrepresent what I had said at a meeting because it was on the agenda. Like, right. here's how planning commission wants us to handle this issue. And I was like, I'm going to the meeting and I'm going to speak. <laughs> and it was way different being in the audience and then coming up and speaking in front of the audience than it was being in charge. Like right. there's just an added level of anxiety. Yes. And I, yes. I stumbled all over myself. Oh, did you? <laughs> but it was, it was fine. It was fine. Yeah. But, you know, like, I'm sure I've had to do it again. It would be a little bit better. That's right? that's kind of what I hope. And then I just think, well, you know, it's it's done. Like it's in the past. Hopefully, people will forget it if it's terrible. Maybe. <laughs> right. Like, oh, that was not the best. Oh well. Yeah. 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 I think people do tend to kind of forget that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, unless you like pass out or something. Well, that, <laughs> there's still time for that. Like, I could if you hear. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. Well, totally shifting gears um, into more of the in the field photography side of things. I'd love for you to tell us about your approach to making photographs in the field. I know in previous chats, you've suggested that you're not a technical person. But I mean, it seems to me through looking at your work that you show incredible technical mastery. So I'd love for you to just walk us through kind of what it looks like on the ground. Victoria, with the camera in hand, what does it look like? Um, I think it's like I, I'm, I am more of a, definitely more of an intuitive shooter. So um, I do struggle with the technical things, but um, I think I, I sort of, um, I, I've always just amassed, sm amassed small amounts of information to allow me to do the thing that I want to do to achieve the thing that I want. So mm -hmm. if I find that I, I, you know, I've been in the field and I'm like, I, I don't know how to do this thing, 
you know, I want to capture this thing, but I don't know how, um, then I'll Google that one thing or I'll watch some YouTube videos or something on that one thing. And then I'll just amass knowledge around that. And then I'll just build on that. And I, I actually have a little um, book next to me in my desk where I write things down of, you know, maybe, I don't know, editing techniques or, you know, shooting techniques or, and, and then just doing it really, just just going out and doing it over and over again. But um, yeah, I, I feel like once you have got that technical knowledge, it does free up your mind to actually be creative you know, so it, you you do need that stuff. You do you do need that stuff to be able to just not have to think about it. And I know, you know, when I was first shooting landscapes, I'd go out there and, you know, you can't really enjoy the landscape because you're so busy, you know, figuring, oh God, what ISO should I have? And, you know, what should my f-stop be? And, you know, how do I do this thing? And then when there, there comes a point where you know that stuff right? and you don't have to even think about it. And so you actually can enjoy the moment yeah and it becomes you know you don't even know what you're doing with your camera you're just reacting to the light or reacting to whatever's happening um and it becomes much more fluid and you know you don't have to think about those technical things yeah but, totally uh, you know with with nikon if they give me a new product it's like they know they have to help me <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, you know, you have to tell me what, how do I program these buttons? <laughs> I know what I want to do, but I don't always know how to get there. And so they'll, uh -huh. and I think, um, yeah, that sometimes, I, I, I don't know whether it's a gender thing too. Sometimes, you know, I find that um, uh, women can be more afraid to ask what they think are technical, stupid technical questions. Um, because they feel like they should know but when they they have me teaching them they don't have to feel stupid <laughs> because they know that I'm technically challenged and it's okay <laughs> like you can get there <laughs> right isn't that such a strange phenomenon like men don't have all the answers either you know what I mean no it's different and sometimes I'll find that so, you know and it's not necessarily <laughs> a gender thing either some people just have like they'll have a, a an artistic ability that right. other people won't have like they have a vision but they might not quite know how to get there right. to get to capture that vision and then some people have all the technical knowledge but they don't have the artistic vision and sometimes that's a lot harder to get them to that place than it is to yeah, that's, people. that's interesting i would much rather have the first one which the, the artists... Like, I would much rather have it be super easy to have all these ideas and, like... Oh, oh yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? I think like, that's that's the harder one to access. So if you come along with that, the other stuff, I think, is easier to... Totally. ...to, to learn than, than the other way around. Right, because, like, once you try it and you see the results, it's like, okay, I remember that now. And I yeah. just have to do this thing, and I have to... Oh, I need a longer shutter speed or whatever, right? Like... Yeah. 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 <laughs> that's funny no I, I think it is it, you're so humble about your lack of technical savvy but I, I mean it's obvious that you know what you're doing to me anyway I don't know <laughs> but a lot of the time I'm just playing I mean I think I'm I think that's the thing that astounds me is I actually you know I think sometimes when I'm teaching people I think oh god I, you know this is so easy like I you know I do know things <laughs> But I actually don't think that I do. But, you know, then I realized, oh, God, I thought everybody knew that. I thought everybody knew that thing. And then I realized that they don't. And actually, I do have knowledge that other people don't have. Right. I there is that. that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, that's a good point. There's lots of stuff I assume people know. And then you go, you, you teach somebody, like, who is very new to photography. And you're like, oh, right. Like, there's all that's this right. other yeah. stuff that you don't even know yet. Yeah, that's right. And I, you know, sometimes I find that with mentoring sessions and some people will come in and they, you know, you ask them what they'd like to tackle and then they tell you the things that they want to tackle. And then when you get into the meat of it, you realize that there's a whole lot of stuff that you need to cover before that bit. Yep. But they didn't know they didn't know that stuff. And so right. you've got to get them to that place that they want to be, but you've got to go through this other stuff first. And then you, you, you realize how much you know at those times, I think. Totally. Well, this might be a formal announcement. I, I don't even know if it's going to be formally announced, and probably, but we'll see. But 
we've brought you on as a judge for the Natural Landscape Photography Award, so I'm super, super excited for that. In fact, when we met a couple of weeks ago, uh, everyone was totally on board with the suggestion um, of bringing you on. And I know you've judged other competitions as well. I'm curious what it is about judging that you enjoy. I, I just, I love looking at, you know, other people's work. Like I find it really inspiring and I, I really, I really want to see something that's different that I haven't seen before. And so I mm -hmm. think, um, yeah, I just, I just love looking at, you know, I've always loved looking at other photographers, other artists. I love looking at other work and I'm always just really excited that I might see something, just see the somebody else's vision of the world that I don't have. I want to see, you know, something that's different. I want to see the world through their eyes. I want to see what they see. Right. Yeah. And, then, and then steal and then steal it. Yeah. And then I'm going to try and do it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, fun. it is funny though. Like having done two years of the NLPA now and looked at a lot of photography, I've definitely gained a lot of like perspectives on how to photograph different types of scenes, just based on judge looking at all those images, mm. you know? Yeah, I think it goes, it kind of, you absorb it sometimes without even knowing that you're absorbing it. Right. Um, right. You're like, yeah. oh, I've seen so many photos that have like repeating patterns or they have this or they have that. And it's like, then you start to recognize it when you're out there. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah, you do. You kind of, I think you absorb it without even knowing that you are. So yeah, it's, right. I find that really interesting. So yeah, I, I just, I enjoy looking at other people's work really. So on the flip side, what do you not like about judging? What is frustrating? Uh, I, I can't really think of anything that oh, is well, frustrating. We'll get you there. Okay. Yeah. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't found it so far. Um, yeah. I've, I've enjoyed my judging experiences so far, but yeah, maybe that's all going to change. <laughs> yeah. No, it's, um, it can be contentious, you know, yeah. especially. Because everyone has opinions, so yeah. But I quite I like that. I like because you know I I I enjoy hearing what other people like, and I think sometimes you that opens you up to something that you hadn't thought about, and I think it's really it's really cool. And I right. love hearing other judges fight for an image that they love and why they, you know, why they like it. I think it's really cool. Yeah, me too. Well, I'm curious from your perspective because this is a. Um... This is something that happens a lot in competitions and something we're trying really, really hard to reduce as much as we can. But I'm curious from your perspective, how do you eliminate personal bias throughout the judging process in terms of like preferences or, you know, things like that? Um, I think even just having the, the knowledge that you might have some bias is a really good way to start that just to have mm -hmm. that knowledge. Um, but then, I mean, I, I think I'm, I think just being really open, not going into it with any particular criteria of what you are looking for, um, is, is probably how I would, you know, the, the way I think about it, you know, I don't have the, and it, and it may be something that I, I don't know, that I wouldn't necessarily shoot myself or, but that doesn't mean that I'm not going to find it really intriguing and really interesting and, you know, I, I just think being completely open and just not having preconceptions of what makes a winning image or, you know, all of that stuff, really. And I, I think as, as a general, quote unquote, generalist, it'll be really interesting to see your take on things, because I think you bring a lot of different perspectives to the table that hasn't been in our judging panel in the past. So it'll be, it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. Yeah, I mean, I've, the other thing that I always come back to as well, my when I did the anthropology and I studied non-Western cultures and how they look at art, or they don't even, you know, it's not even art, it's part of their culture. They come at it from such a different perspective that, that I always hold on to that. You know, we have a very Western notion of what art is, and it's just a very Western notion of what it is. And so there are whole, you know, cultures of people who think about things in an, an entirely different way. And so with that, I always kind of hold on to that to try and keep my mind open to stuff. Mm. 
I like it. I can't wait. I can't wait for this. This is gonna be so much fun. All right. Well, last question. Who do you recommend for the podcast? Okay, so I, there are so many artists that I love and I honestly could have picked so many different photographers and, you know, weekly I check, you know, weekly I'm just like, oh God, I love their stuff and then, oh, I love their stuff. So this is not a reflection of my top three photographers or anything like that. This is just three people that at that moment I just thought, oh, how about them? Because <laughs> um, I just like their stuff. Um, so one of them is um, a woman called Jo Stephen. Um, she's based in the UK and mm -hmm. um, she has very sort of ethereal kind of nature photography. Um, she uses, you know, some are quite representative. Some of her images are quite sort of representational and some of them she uses uh, techniques like ICM and, or not IC, oh yeah, I think she uses ICM, but. Um, like a lot of multiple exposures. Multiple stuff. exposures, that's right, yeah. And uh, I know she, she kind of, she she is stays local pretty much local to where she lives um and i think she's a she she works in in ancient woodland conservation um, oh. so i just find i find her work interesting and it would be interesting to know some of her thought processes i think yeah. um so there's her uh and i'm not sure if i'm going to pronounce uh hans gonna Al alex alex alexson <laughs> alexson is it a a Aslixen? Oh, I'd, oh yeah, it's got an S in there. Aslixen, yeah, sorry. I haven't got my glasses on. <laughs> but he is a Norwegian photographer. So he does a combination of kind of broader, wider landscape scenes and smaller um, scenes as well. So he has some really beautiful stuff and I particularly like his smaller scenes. Yeah, I, lovely. I, uh, then, I really like his stuff a lot. Yeah, he, he's got some lovely stuff. Um, and then um, Monica Deviat. So she is a Canadian photographer. Um, she's actually somebody I met at the Light Chasers conference that Shane Turgeon has um, created. And um, we kind of hit it off. We're both introverts. Uh, she is, um, she, she shoots a lot of night photography. Yep. And so she spends a lot of time up mountains in the dark on her own. And so I find her an interesting person just because of, um, just because of the fact that she does a lot of that stuff. She's, you know, she's pretty much always on her own and she, you know, goes off into the night and sits up the top of mountains waiting for stars and sunrises and different things. So yeah. And and she's an incredible athlete. I don't know if you've Oh followed, yeah. She, like she, she I don't know what that's called, but she's I don't wanna... she, she runs a pole dancing studio. Okay, yeah, you so said she, it, not me. I... Yeah, yeah. Well that, that's she's a she's a pole dancing teacher. Yeah. No, but it's incredible. Oh, she is strong. Like she's a very strong lady. So she's a strong, you know, mentally and physically. She's, you don't want to mess with her. You don't want to meet her on a dark night in the wrong place. Oh yeah, I'm sure her her abs are like steel. Oh yeah, yeah. She is a very strong lady. Um, yeah, and so she and I talk a lot about our struggles with being introverts and having to, you know, present and do different things like that. Um, but yeah, so yeah. And she's gonna, she's gonna, you guys are gonna co, co lead a, a, a pole dancing workshop? Yeah, I, I've talked to her about that. Yeah, I'm like the T Rex with the, <laughs> the little arms. Well, you can I photograph can't even do a people. Right? Yeah, I can't do a push up. Like my, my arms are <laughs> so crap. But uh, yeah, we, we do laugh about that quite a lot. Yeah, she sends me T Rex little things. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's brilliant. Oh, uh, super funny. Well, Victoria, this has been super fun and I had a great time getting to know you more and I can't wait to work with you on NLP year, NLPA year three. Thank you, Matt. It's been really great. Thank you for making me feel so relaxed. I appreciate it. Oh, of course. Well, thank you to Victoria for the wonderful conversation. I really had a great time and I appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedule to join me on the show. I'm really excited to work with you on the Natural Landscape Photography Awards, which will reopen on June 1st for entries. This year, we will be closing entries a month earlier on July 31st, so don't wait to enter. Victoria wanted me to tell you about a couple of workshops that she has available this year, including one that she's teaching with Monica Deviat 
in Waterton Lakes National Park starting May 29th, as well as another workshop that she has in mid to late September where she will be taking people to photograph larches and fall color in the Canadian Rockies. If these sound of interest to you, check them out on her website, which you can find a link to in the show notes. Okay, that's all for now. Thanks for stopping in, collaborating with us, and listening. See you next week.